Hey everybody, welcome back. I am really excited that you are here. We have the most fascinating interview today. We are going to talk about all things water. You are gonna be so educated by the time we are done. You're gonna know everything you need to know about water in Southern Utah. So stay tuned. I'm gonna introduce you to Paul Monroe. Welcome back. I am so glad that you are here. I am Jenny Hendricks and I am here with Paul Monroe. Paul is the general manager of the Central Iron County Water Conservancy District. It's a mouthful. You got it right. It is. Thank you. I, I really appreciate your time today. This is actually a video that was requested by a subscriber and the questions that I get asked every single day so many of those questions have to do with water, water rights, water availability, the sources of water, all of that kind of stuff. So I thought, who better to ask than the grand high guru of all things water in Iron County? So who did you ask? You. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> Paul, tell us a little bit um, maybe about like a short history of you, a little bit of history about the Water Conservancy District, what do you do? Who cares? Why is it important? Tell us what we need to know about the organization. Then we'll kind of do a deep dive into all things water in the area. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, so I am the general manager, like you mentioned, for the Water Conservancy District. I've been here, this is, uh, I guess, my 10th year. Has it been that long? Yeah, it's crazy. I think it doesn't seem like it, but then, you know, you <laughs> Some days have, have much hair I don't have <laughs> right. anymore, and, and I guess it has been 10 years. <laughs> but I, I started kind of in the water world as I was going to school here at SUU, working for Kane County Water up at Duck oh, Creek. okay. And okay. that's where I got my start. I worked for them and then um, moved over to Kanab for a little while and uh -huh. then got the call from the board, Water Conservancy District Board, to come okay. back and, Good. and uh, operate here. And so we've, we've been here doing that for like I said, close to 10 years, but the district was formed prior to that in 1997 mm. by popular vote mm -hmm. here in, among the, the community. And it's the central Iron County because um, the other portions of the county, Parowan, Paraguna, Brinehead, they did not want to be part of the district and neither did the borough area. Okay. okay. So it's kind of the central portion, Cedar Valley area that's part Is of Is Enoch the included in it? Enoch and okay. Canaraville. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Cool. Okay. So... There's some maps on our website that we can you can see the, the full section of that, but it's primarily Cedar Valley. Okay. We will um, put up a link to that website because there it's got a ton of really good information. So watch for that. Yeah. Um, I guess just a little bit more kind of my own personal history is um, been involved with Water My Whole Life, grew up on a ranch and my great, great grandpa, when he first came over with the early pioneers was actually sent to Iron County because he was an iron puddler from England. That's so Brigham nice. Young seven down here is an iron puddler. And after a few years, he got together with some friends and one of his friends said, there's some water to be got in Scipio. <laughs> that's so, the technical term. That's right. If you are from the area, there is yeah. water to be got. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so uh, he moved his family up to Scipio and developed the springs, built the reservoir that's there and multiple other things. And that same water that he developed was the same water that I grew up on, you know, six, Neat. six generations that's later. That's cool. Okay. Very cool. And then I guess full circle is I'm back down here in Cedar Valley trying to find where there can be some water to be got. Yeah. So. Yeah. That is... So the, the saying that I have heard locally is that uh, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there seems to be no shortage of that. Yeah. That is really interesting. So what is, what is the purpose of the Central Iron County Water Conservancy District? Why do you exist? I think if, well, for one, legislatively, as they were established, Water Conservancy Districts you know, been around since the 30s, and ours, of course, was organized in 97. But it, its primary focus is to make sure that water is available for the next 50 years. That's kind of the short answer to it. And so it's all things water, conservation, water development, building pipelines, reservoirs, tanks, everything to make sure that our community will have water for the next 50 years. So Will we? 
Well, yeah, that's a good question, right? That's uh, <laughs> um, There are lots of moving parts right yeah. now, and we'll get into the details of that, I think, in yes. a little bit. But yeah, there's, there's of course, uh, we've got an aquifer that is declining, but it's also a very, very large aquifer, too. And so there's things that we want to do to protect that and ensure that it'll be there long term. Okay, talk to us a little bit about that, because that is the main source for water in this area. So talk to us a little bit about what the aquifer is, where is it located, how is it fed, how is it decreasing. Give us give us the aquifer sort of conversation here. Yeah, so I guess if you kind of consider the aquifer, that's the kind of the basin, the valley floor. And underneath that, if you think of like a, a bathtub that's full of gravel and rocks and sands, that makes up the aquifer. And there's a whole bunch of straws that are in that that are sucking at it. And every year, Mother Nature gives us our snowpack and rainfall that's up on the mountains and it makes its way down to the valleys and down into that aquifer. And scientific reports show uh, that there's about 21,000 acre feet of water that comes into that aquifer every year. So if we consider that every year we get 21,000 acre feet in and then what's going out is 28. Okay. So, so if we consider that in like a checkbook sense, yeah. <laughs> if you lose $7,000 every year, eventually... You're you not know, getting ahead. Now, I want to pause here because I think probably most of the people who are interested in water and who are probably watching this video know what an acre foot of water is. But some may not. So what is an acre foot of water? How, why, do we, why do we speak in terms of acre feet? Uh, yeah, so an acre foot is, if you imagine a football field buried one foot deep in water. Okay. So it's 300 and about 26,000 gallons. Okay. So in, in terms of what that translates into as far as usage, what, what does an acre foot of water mean? So if you had like your, a residential home that had a significant amount of turf and a family of four, they would use about that much water in a year. An acre foot? Yeah. I did not know that. Hmm. Um, but you know, some of our more recent landscape trends yeah. and smaller lot sizes and yeah. things like that. And, and people have just become more water conscious over time. Um, we're seeing that number decline, okay. which is a great thing. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, so back to the aquifer now. We're, we're putting in 21,000 acre feet annually and we're taking out 28,000 acre feet annually. Um, that doesn't seem like a, a healthy pace yeah, to be able to maintain. Not sustainable and we need to obviously you know we, we need to find out ways that we can improve that um, but one thing that the state has done because the state manages those water rights right. is they've come in and they've implemented what's called a groundwater management plan. Yeah which everybody here is really really in love with. <laughs> everybody loves the groundwater management plan. Yeah and, I, and I'm just glad I'm not the agency that's the enforcer. <laughs> so what is the groundwater management plan? So it took several years to adopt and put into place but it eventually was adopted last year in January of 2021. Okay. <clears throat> and what it does is that the state is it like I mentioned is in charge of those water rights and they issue the right that's why it's called a right is you have a right to use it. Mm -hmm. And so the state actually owns all of the water rights in the entire state of Utah. Mm -hmm even though they're publicly traded like property like rights, property. like uh -huh. real property, yep. the state owns those rights and they kind of tell you whether or not you can use them or right. not. And so it's really easy to think of this as like a river system where, you know, as water's coming down the stream, Utah water law and Utah water rights is the first person that made a claim on that, similar mm -hmm. to like a mining claim, mm -hmm. they would be the first ones that could use it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Grandpa Joe comes along several decades ago and he writes his claim. He's the first one to, you to pull that water and use it. And then someone else comes along and they have a second claim. So then if the stream, you know, during the pre peak runoff during the spring, everybody gets fulfilled. But as the, as the summer, late summer comes on and the streams start to get smaller, that first person that had his claim first would be able to use his full water and those that came after may not be able to. Right. So if we use that sense of the aquifer, um, what you have is kind of here in your bathtub, you've got water rights that were issued from the 1800s on up to when they stopped issuing water rights in 1966. Mm -hmm. So if we kind of compare that, you've got uh, your water rights that go up to 1966 and at some level, you've got 
your cutoff date of, of what your safe yield is of the 21,000 acre feet. Okay. So if we level those two out, we come to a, kind of this equilibrium of water rights and safe yield, and that equates to the year of 1934. So you'll hear, I know you've that's heard that the, a lot, That's right? the magic number. So any anytime I've got clients who are looking for land that is not connected to a municipal water source, so whether it's uh, Cedar City Enoch or the Central Iron County Water Conservancy District, we talk about water rights and the priority date is not something that we've really paid attention to historically. Now, if you are out purchasing water rights, um, that date is a big, big deal and it has made water rights that are pre-1934 far more valuable. They're a lot more expensive now. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, in our analysis, they've gone up 400%. Yeah, in, they have in the last... like 5,000 to about 20,000. Yeah. Um, just in the last couple of years. The magic date that we're talking about is 1934. That's the cutoff date. What what does it mean to cut off that water? Like, why yeah. is that important? Who cares? Yeah, yeah, good, very good point. So now we're, we're going to kind of take a look at these two leveling points, right? And we're going to talk about everything that's 1934 and senior or, or up to that 1966 point. And as the plan expresses it is that there's going to be cuts where they'll limit you from using that water. In other words, that stream has dried up to a point where you can't use those water rights based strictly on priority. So it is possible that a person could own a water right that was later than 1934 and at some point in time not be able to use that water. The state would take it back. Yeah, and, and it's kind of ma it's mapped out in the state plan, and, and we'll provide some links, I'm guessing, okay, on, on here of, yeah. of how they can access and look at that groundwater management plan. Um, but the, the first cut occurs in 14 years now, so okay. it was 15 years from, the pl from when the plan started. So in 14 years, 2035, that first cut will occur, and I think there's around 6,000 acre feet that will be you know kind of withheld. Is that going to be sort of uh, attrition based? So if someone has an active well and they're using it for household or livestock or whatever, and then there might be someone who has water rights of the same year, but maybe they're not in use, the state would take the non-used ones first or would they start taking actively used water rights? Yeah, really good question. But the, And the answer to that is, they will just go strictly off of priority. Okay. In other words, if you're using it or not using it, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, and that's just based off of historical, like that's the foundation of Utah water law uh -huh. is just straight priority. Yeah. And that's really the only tool that the state engineer has. And so the state engineer will, he'll evaluate and he'll look at those rights and whether they're using them or not, it doesn't matter. I guess his, in their view, the state would say, well, you can go out and purchase somebody who is not using their right and <laughs> move it to your well. And is so. a an earlier priority date. Right. And move it to that well. That's that I mean, yeah, that's gonna be an interesting um, round of lawsuits, I suspect, <laughs> at that point in time. Yeah, right. But yeah, there's that's gonna be interesting because the the state of Utah's never had to do anything like that before. Um, so this is this is a whole new world for, for folks when you're talking about water rights and, and um, it, it's a big deal. Yeah, and, and so a little bit of background on that. The first one that was implemented was in the Burl Enterprise area, uh -huh. but they have not, like you mentioned, they've not experienced those cuts yet, and uh, neither we. Pair One is currently in the process of adopting another okay. one, and then just north of that in the Pavent Valley, which is in Millard County, there, okay. there'll be the next one that will go through this whole process. So the state has identified these different basins Unfortunately, three of the basins are here in Iron County that yeah. have groundwater management yeah. plants. Yeah. Okay, so now we know about the aquifer. We know about acre feet of water. We know about the timing of the water rights, but we're still mining the aquifer is what has, is sort of the term that we use here. You mentioned earlier that the aquifer is filled from several different sources. How does, how does the water get back into the aquifer? So yeah, I mean, I guess naturally and primarily it, it happens through some subsurface flows from the mountain block as water goes, seeps into the ground there, it flows in subsurface. Uh, 
the primary source, of course, is Coal Creek mm-hmm. that comes down, mm-hmm. and that recharges a lot of the aquifer. And, uh, and then we just have the, the precipitation that falls on top of the ground um, and is not consumed by either evaporation or plants. Right, right. And so as it makes its way back, that's, that's how it gets recharged. There are some artificial recharge projects mm-hmm. that the district has been doing for a number of years uh, where we artificially try and put water back into the ground so that uh, we can recharge that artificially. And, and really what these are, these are attempts that the district is doing to try and offset those cuts or try and offset what our impact is on the aquifer. So between conservation, recharge, and optimally using our water, you know, those are our main focuses of, of just trying to be able to be good water stewards yeah. of, of our water in our basin. I've, I've been told that the recharge pits, the recharge, the artificial recharge that is happening has not been as successful as we hoped. Is there a way to measure yeah. the water that is going in through those human created recharge pits and whether or not that is actually helping the aquifer? Yeah, so you can actively go on our website and and see all of the different recharge locations and see live data of how much water is going into them. Okay. Um, And really what we're limited to is just by what Mother Nature gives us. And we all know that we're in the third consecutive dry year or drought. And as far as the records go, this is the most significant drought we've been in on history. We go back 128 years on the, on the history, and, and we've never had a string of three consecutive years that have been this dry. And when you consider that with we've only been recharging for, you know, since 2017, mm-hmm. um, we don't have a lot of data to see how well we're doing. But we also haven't been able to put water into them because we, have, we don't have the water we to do the water it. We haven't had have water coming so in. So as far as the success goes, you, we can highlight a couple of years. We can highlight the year 2019 where we put nearly 10,000 acre feet back into the aquifer. Wow. Okay. So we're able to calculate that. We're able to see that. So in one year, we put in you know nearly half of what our annual budget is nice. by artificially putting okay. it in. Okay. But when you compare that to the last three years, yeah. Um, I think total the last three years, it's been less than 3,000 acre feet. Okay. It's like a thousand acre feet per year. Wow. Well, so very minimal. Yeah. yeah. So the nice thing about it is that the facilities are there. They're uh-huh. in place. When we receive the water, we'll be able to, to uh, do it and put it in. And, and uh, we've also just implemented another project out at Quichapa, a large expansion. Oh, okay. Um, where we uh, built a, a dike, a dam across half of the lake. And we'll be able to store more water there. And then we've got it all pl- piped and plumbed so that we can supply an agricultural producer okay. that's there with that water. Okay, let me let me unpack because there's a lot that you just said <laughs> right there. So the first thing that I, I, I want to kind of explore. So you said we, we've expanded Quichapa. Yeah. Tell us about why that is significant. What is Quichapa? <laughs> Who is Quichapa? What is a Quichapa? <laughs> um, and why is that expansion important? And then if I can throw three questions at you at the same time, you also mentioned the agriculture portion of it. And I think a lot of folks may not know that agriculture actually uses, what, about 70? 75%. 75% of the water. So when we're talking about 28,000 acre feet, only about 25% of that is residential use. And commercial use. Most of that is agricultural use. So talk to us about Quichapa, talk to us about the expansion, and then talk about why it's important to to sort of bring our agriculture folks into this solution. Oh, that's perfect. That's that's really, this is a really exciting project for me. This is uh, one that's been really fun. So Quichapa itself, um, the lake is, is traditionally a dry playa. It, it dries out every year. Um, and why is that? Uh, there's no there's no outflow and there's there's the inflow is is not constant. Either. Yeah. And the other thing is 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 uh, as Quichapa as the water comes into there, a lot of the sediments that have come down have come off of cedar breaks, uh-huh. which have a lot of clay in them. 
So when the water gets out there, it, it actually doesn't do any good for our aquifer either because it just evaporates. Right. So it's almost 100% that we lose that water yeah. once it reaches there. Yeah. Historically, it has had water in it, but because of the clay, the water goes in, it doesn't recharge into the aquifer. It just sits there and evaporates and just becomes kind of mud and, and, and dried mud and can't really do anything with it. Yeah, and, and the other negative effect there is that those flash floods, they bring a lot of salts and minerals with them and so when the water gets out there and sits out there for a long period of time it, it becomes very brine and and salty water and not usable either mm -hmm. um, i remember when i first got here we wanted to pump that water up to some agricultural users mm -hmm. uh, but as we tested it it was you know over 12 times above the usable limit of, as far as saline content? Yes, okay. yeah. Okay. And, and that's called, what, what we measure that as what's called TDS, or total dissolved solids. Okay. So that, that includes all of your salts and your metals and your minerals okay. that are in the water. Okay. And so uh, back in 2017, we, we started kind of a little pilot program where we diverted the water before it got to the lake and moved it over to some pumps and pumped it up to an area that was more gravelly. Mm -hmm to recharge the aquifer. Mm -hmm. As important because one of Cedar City's main wells that supplies all of Cedar City is right in that vicinity. Okay. And so we were going to be recharging right there close to the city nice. well. And it's just evolved over time to where that worked. And um, in 2018, it was a dry year. The lake was completely dry. And then in 2019, as I mentioned, we got a lot of water we were able to recharge mm -hmm. a lot of water and there was a lot of water that made it out to Quichapa. Mm -hmm. and so we went out there and we started sampling it and the water out there actually was usable for a period of about six months okay and it, it progressively increased with with TDS or salts and minerals and that's just because as the wind blew the mm -hmm. water it would kind of churn up the dust mm -hmm. or the mud and dirt mm -hmm. and the water will absorb and pick up those mm -hmm. minerals so that's when we said, hey, we can use this water. We built a dam across and some other diversions so that now we can take that water when we have it, store it there, um, and then pump it to two center pivots, a farmer that's right there, and he can irrigate with water that would have been wasted mm -hmm. instead of pumping out of the underground. I, I, that, I think, is such an exciting concept um, and one that w that is just starting to, I think, be part of the, the conversation. So, so the reason that's important is this, this farmer is pulling water out of the aquifer. He's got a straw in the aquifer and he's pulling that out and in his pivots that are on his alfalfa, presumably, he's pulling water out of the aquifer to water his land, his crops. He's able to not use that water that's coming out of the aquifer and use this diverted water for this period of time. So his well is resting, that water's not coming out of the aquifer, but you're using the water from the surface that has come down and is usable now, but may not be usable later. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's okay. exactly it. The other neat thing too is that, you know, that's, it's within a mile of our municipal drinking water wells that nice. are right there. And so by him idling his groundwater, that just helps stabilize the aquifer in that area. Yeah, I think that's great. And I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on this, but the, the state of Utah is really exploring a lot of like water banking kind of things and um, it, it, trying to be proactive because we have to now with alternative ways to maintain the the levels of what we need to as far as agriculture and lifestyle and and still preserve our water resources that's really the foundation for everything so that's cool i yeah. didn't know that that's cool now i would like to ask you about the thing that most folks who are talking about water ask me the pipeline hmm. the water rights in the wawa and hamblin valleys give us a really brief history of why Iron County and Cedar City get to tap water in a different county. Yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> um, I guess just for a little bit of background is that this isn't anything that's revolutionary. <laughs> um, this is something that's, that's happened all around the West. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, I'm from Scipio, and anybody that's born along the Severe River drainage 
um, which starts actually up here in Iron County. Right. And, and on the backside of Brian. Yeah, and the backside yeah. flows back to the east and goes down through, um, you know, Panguitch uh -huh. and Paiute County and Sevier County and all of those counties along the way. I think there's about seven counties. Um, there was a gentleman that back in the early 1900s that went and filed on those water rights. Again, meant first in time, first in uh -huh. right. Uh -huh. And because of that, there's a, all those folks that have to watch that water go by yeah. because they have the senior rights to the Severe River. Um, and at an early age, you learn that uh, that it's those those dang SOBs from Delta that stole our water. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, water water crosses uh, transbation boundaries all the time. There's there's no such thing as a county boundary when it comes to water. Again, the water belongs to the state of Utah and the state of Jr. issues those water rights. Um, but, uh, you know, and in fact, if you were to look at the Salt Lake Valley, most of their water comes from pipelines from water in Duchesne County that that traditionally went to the Colorado River oh. that's been diverted. And, okay. you know, about two thirds of their water, two thirds of the population that's up there wouldn't be able to be right. there if yeah. it wasn't for yeah. those pipelines. Yeah. So us down here, we did something similar. We filed on water rights that, uh, and this wasn't until 2006. And so there, those basins out there, Wawa, Pine Valley, Hamlin Valley, they hadn't been fully appropriated or appropriated. And uh, the district went and filed on those rights in 2006 and started the process. And part of the process is we went through hearings with the state engineer, uh, conducted multiple scientific studies and analysis before the state engineer felt comfortable enough to approve those water rights. And after they were approved, they were litigated. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we spent several years mediating and negotiating between the state, Beaver County, um, and CITLA, along with a mining company that was out there. And in 2019, we reached settlement, and we we're really proud of that. We gave Beaver County um, a significant amount of water so that they could move forward with their mining project along with some other water. Um, and so the mine was able to move forward, Sitla property, they were able to move forward, Beaver County. All of us, we felt like it was a win-win. Mm -hmm. And for us, we were able to move forward with our main focus, which was Pine Valley. Mm -hmm. And so we moved forward with that and that settled the lawsuits. And now we're into the environmental portion of it. Yeah, which I'm sure that's gonna be all kinds of fun. How much water is there? Potentially, how much water can come to Iron County? So the water right in Pine Valley was approved for 15,000 acre feet. And uh, in Wawa Valley, it's a little bit kind of chopped up, but there's 6,500 acre feet that's available there with another 4,025 that's a fixed time. Okay. And that's annually. That's annually. That's yep. a number of acre feet that we could potentially pipe per year. Bring in every okay. year. Yep. Okay. So you're in the environmental part of the study right now. What comes next? So within the environmental portion, we've, we've just finished up public comment and um, we will address those and have a final EIS available in October timeframe. And then we'd hope to have a decision from the BLM come December or the first of the year. Because you've got to come across BLM land yeah. with your pipeline yep. to get to Iron County. Yep. Okay. And they are the federal agency, the lead agency with that because it is their property. And so we've done, we've spent a significant amount of time and scientific reports and analysis to, to address and, and review all potential issues that we might <laughs> run into. So how do we pay for that? Um, so paying for it is something that we'll continue to evaluate. Um, but if you were to just take that and break that down today, based off of the number of residents and users that are here, and if you were to, to take the total cost, which is estimated to be $260 million, and you were to just put that on the shoulders of everybody that lives here, every household mm -hmm. that's here, that would increase their water bill by about $55 per month. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of just say that because it sends out a shock, yeah. for one. 
but it's not the only way that it gets paid back. So that's almost like kind of like this is the worst case scenario. This is everybody that's here. This is us burning this. This is no more growth. Uh-huh. And part of that no more growth is no impact fees, yeah. which, you know, your impact fees would go to pay for that. Yeah. Um, taxes, we're able to pay, pay it back with taxes. And then there's also the potential like right now where the, the federal government has issued a lot of dollars towards infrastructure. Right. Um, there are grants and other things that are available that you could tie into as well. Okay. So I can 100% tell you that growth is continuing to happen. Yeah. <laughs> it is It is not a possibility that we are not going to continue to grow. So just plan on that because yeah. these folks are moving here. We've been discovered everybody wants to be here because it's a pretty cool place to live. Yes. So it sounds like you're, you're pretty far down the road on being able to access that, uh, that amount of water and get it here in a pipeline for an for an, a, a cost that can be defined right right now okay yeah and you know there'll be there's a lot of uh, breakdown and a lot of things that, that we'll work through with with Cedar City I mean ultimately it's going to come down to a vote of our community mm-hmm. whether or not we want to do this or not yeah and really what changes in that is is how we want our community to grow right or how we want our community to look. Mm-hmm. Because if we don't do this project, then we drastically change what our community looks yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, we're not, we're not policy makers in that regard. Again, we're just here to make sure that water is available for the next 50 years. And so you know, we're trying to do, take all of those steps to make sure that yeah. we provide that. And so you know, if, if the community at large says, no, this is not something we're interested in right now, then you have to look at what we're going to do to replace that or what do we shift to and at that point it looks more like well we may have to get rid of all of our agriculture yeah. and, or we may have to look at completely getting rid of our lawns and landscape yeah. and things like that yeah. um, and so those things are, are you know policy shifts and things like that that we all have to consider as we go through this process. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, agriculture is such a, an integral part of our, our culture and our history. I just, I can't imagine that, that this community would say, oh yeah, that's the answer. Um, so I suspect that with proper education, people will realize that it's, this is probably the right direction to go. But we'll see. Is, what else do we need to know about water in the area or 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 what the Water Conservancy District is doing. Yeah, I think maybe just uh, as far as individually, maybe people want to know like, what can we do? I like right? it, yeah, let's talk um, about that. So we've got a few, uh, you know, a number of suggestions that you can do, but really it just, it kind of comes down to being water conscious. Mm-hmm. You know, our campaign this year is Water Less Iron County. <laughs> and so you can do a lot of things to just start there and water less. I mean, right now we've, We've been able to be fortunate to have some monsoons yes. that are not detrimental. They've yes. been, been manageable so yes. far. And that, and it just if, what Paul is referencing because we're 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 doing this video at a, a moment in time, but hopefully if people are going to watch it for a long time. So if we get monsoon rains usually uh, the end of July and first part of August, and that is a, a just an incredible asset to the aquifer. I mean, everybody's lawn is green the golf course is beautiful <laughs> um we haven't had monsoon rains for a couple of years up until we got everything all at once <laughs> uh 600 year floods and it it was um it, it, it impacted a lot of folks so yeah. we're grateful for this year where we've had those beautiful monsoon rains spread out nice and evenly <laughs> yeah. and uh, it really has been uh, a benefit to this area yeah so when those happen you know that's something you can do is go in and make sure you adjust your your clock on mm-hmm. your lawns and and uh, shut off your water for a week or two and uh, just let mother nature take care of that that really does from a, a water managing standpoint you can really see the impacts if people adjust their clocks on their okay. timers it really slows down the the withdrawal from okay. our from our wells. Okay. Two thirds of our water from our our drinking water, our municipal water, goes to people using it outdoors. Two thirds. I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. So okay. we use a significant water amount of our water just in our landscapes. Okay. And so that's that's one area where we can change, and um, we've got 
a local scapes program, which is about landscaping and how you can adjust your landscaping so that you can water less mm -hmm. um, within your showers and uh, brushing your teeth and things like that. It's really simple to just uh, not use as much water. So those are just a couple of things that people can do. Um, I know in my yard this year, I took out the turf in my front yard and yeah. put in artificial turf. The oh, no Faint kidding. grass. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> it's I'm actually the, really impressed. It's all the rage now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's comfortable. It's, it looks good. And be interested to see what it looks like in January yeah. when it's when it's all green and every and uh, it shouldn't be if that's gonna look weird or uh -huh. not. But, uh. now, okay, so so residential use you can you kind of cut down on your landscaping use, brushing your teeth, you know, showering that kind of stuff. But if we're doing that, if we're turning off the water while we're brushing our teeth and then turning it back on to rinse, that's only being able to impact about twenty five percent of our whole entire usage, right? Yeah. So talk to me about what agriculture is doing. Yeah, good question. And, and uh, that, like, that is a big focus of ours is because that's clearly where we can get a bigger bang for the buck. 75% mm -hmm. of the water is used through agriculture. And we've got some really neat partnerships that we've created with our local university, SUU, and Utah State University. Uh -huh. And we've got a cool test plot out there where we have, they are analyzing um, multiple different irrigation techniques cross-sectioned with different crops, mm -hmm. drought-resistant crops. And, and when I say by drought-resistant crops, it's not like these weird crops. It's They're just using um, different types of corn or alfalfa seeds okay. that are supposed to be drought-resistant, and, and they're getting yields from those. And uh, the research that's coming from that is really neat. We've been able to, from that, we, you know, we've been able to uh, partner and get with our legislators and get resources so that we can actually convert some of these pivots over to some smarter irrigation practices. Mm -hmm. It's called LEPA, low elevation precision application. And that wa then that uh, application goes on, the, the, the sprinkler puts the water right at the ground instead of, I know if you drive by a lot of these pivots and it's a windy day, you'll see the yeah, it's just mist spraying. just blowing, yeah. you know. Yeah clear up to the Wasatch Front right. before it hits the ground. <laughs> yeah. And so this is able to get those drops right down near the ground. And um, it's uh, the science behind it shows that it can be about 20% more efficient. So, That's a big deal. Yeah. You're talking about that much water. Yeah, you're talking 20%. And if we were to convert all the center pivots, as we've calculated, there's about 8,000 acres in Cedar Valley that's uh -huh. under those pivots. and and. You know, that's about 5,000 acre feet that we can save Wow, for that's cool. That's yeah. cool. So every little bit helps, and then those the, the ag people, are, um, that's going to make an even bigger impact. So are there any other like technologies or things that are coming up that are going to help with either recharge or conservation or, you know, all of these, these moving pieces that go into our, our world here in Iron County when it comes to water? Yeah, so I, I guess under our conservation umbrella, we look at, like you mentioned, conserving, um, you know, just down to the last drop. And then we, we have recharge that we put underneath that umbrella, you know, just optimally using every drop that comes out of out of Coal Creek and our streams. Um, but then the other one that we often don't want to think about is what we flush down the toilet. <laughs> and so... There are plans to utilize that water and put it back to, to a more efficient use, similar to what we're doing out at Quichapa. You okay. know, we'd like to be able to take the water and, and uh, it, it's already treated to a type two, which is clean enough to use for an agriculture purposes. Okay. And so we'd like to uh, put that on some agricultural fields so that we can idle those groundwater wells to help stabilize the aquifer. So similar concept to what we're talking about at Quichapa, where you're using existing water at the surface instead of dipping that straw in and taking it out of the, the aquifer. Now that the, the the wastewater is still sort of being developed. It's it's not quite perfected yet. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, so there's there's current plans and looking at planning to be able to utilize that and that's where we're at. That's the stage we're at right now okay. is kind of in the planning process. So maybe that... in, maybe in a couple years we'll come back and do an update and you can tell us how the affluent water yeah situation is 
I think at that point we'll be just as, hopefully just as excited as we are about our Quichapa project. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Which is really it's a really cool project. I I did not know that there was that much going on out there. That's really cool. Okay, so we started out talking about your goal as an organization is to make sure that we have water for the next fifty years. So do we? Um, we have plans. We have programs <laughs> in place, right? That we will. We have, uh, you know, kind of a knife or a chopping block that's coming down from the state yeah. through the groundwater management plan that will enforce or ensure that we will. Yeah. Um, I, you know, either way, we're going to have water resources in, available in the future. Okay. Um, you know, it, it may look differently here, yeah. or we may act differently, or have to be forced to act differently. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, you, or we may have some additional water resources coming in. Okay. Um, both of those provide us those those options to do that. In so many meetings that I attend, and, and so many folks that are coming here, and and so many of our great local folks are asking, how can we continue to build at the pace that we are building if there is a water shortage? So, what do you say to people who are asking that question? Yeah, right. Like we're asking people, hey, you guys need to conserve. You need to use less water. And we're telling everybody you, you need to use less water. And then we've got um, the other side of it where we keep on building houses. We get the same comments and questions regularly. And really kind of the answer to that is, is that right now, if a development happens, they have to bring the water with them. And so they are actually likely just converting a farm to houses at yeah. this point. And yeah. so... Um, I guess if you can conceptually realize that you know this what these houses they have to bring their water with them mm -hmm. then that's the reason why we continue to build so again this goes back to people's private property rights of yeah. those water and those water rights yeah if a farmer wants to you know sell his farm because he can get twenty thousand dollars an acre foot for uh -huh. his water uh -huh. and retire uh -huh. um, is it your right to tell him that he cannot do that? Yeah. And so it, it goes back to kind of a, a private property right yeah. discussion yeah. and policy discussion. And so not necessarily of, you know, it's not that a house uses any more water than a farm does. Right. Right. It's it's that it's a different use now. Right. Instead of being farmed and put on for a crop, it's being used at a house. Or culinary or lawns or whatever. Okay. So you feel confident saying that we can continue to build, we continue to have people move here, and we're going to be okay. We are going to be okay, especially with, you know, I think everybody is more conscious the yeah. way that homes are being put in now. Yeah. Uh, they use that local scape approach mm -hmm. of not having every cor from corner to corner of their entire yard put into grass, right. but it's diversified, beautiful, yeah. Yeah. and uh, it's it makes sense. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. All right, well, Paul, thank you so much for your time. I am so grateful that you were able to carve out a little bit of your day and educate us and all of our folks on everything that we need to know about water, so thank you. Thank you, thanks for coming in. All right, this is Jenny Hendricks, and I didn't tell you this before, but if you want to continue to see these awesome videos that we drop every Thursday, make sure you subscribe, hit that notification bell, and we'll see you soon, bye-bye.